Welcome back to Comedian MTG, my name is Ian. On today's episode, we're going to be breaking down this tournament called March Madness, which was held actually a couple weeks ago in Tennessee. And uh, it looks pretty cool. You know, there's a lot of tournaments that are happening lately, which is awesome as a CEDH player. There's so many new events and, and things like that that are happening. But this event stuck out to me because I was going through the deck list from this tournament and there was just a lot of really cool decks. And it wasn't a small tournament either. There were 81 players at this event. And some of these top performing decks were, uh, to be honest, bangers. It's kind of funny, I was actually talking with the TOs about maybe being able to attend this tournament, but unfortunately it didn't work out this time. But definitely interested in checking out more of these events in the future. But I had to cover this event because the top 16 is pretty sick. While you're here on YouTube, if you like videos like this, make sure to hit that like button, that subscribe button. Let me know in the comments below if you're really enjoying these top 16 breakdowns and finding out more about these decks. I know we've been on sort of a tournament report kick lately, but you know, time to do the old fashioned top 16 breakdown, the, the bread and butter of this channel and we'll, we'll go through there. While you're also here, make sure to check out patreon.com slash if you're interested in helping the channel out. You know, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, some new stuff lately, working on the Patreon tiers and getting those retooled, as I mentioned in last week's episode. So a lot of big stuff coming on the way. And hopefully by the time this episode's out, there's already some of that restructuring going on. Which is pretty sick. Um, my hope is to start pushing more videos out uh, pretty soon and you know we, we did struggle a little bit after uh, losing our editors uh, a little bit way through last year and we were going to be doing double videos every week and had a bit of a setback on that front so you know any support in this time uh, to help and get that stuff kickstarted we're at least going to be pushing at least another short a week on top of the regular videos so hoping to get all that up and running pretty soon without any further ado I say let's jump into this top 16. So we've already got a spicy list here with the Might of Minas Morgul, which is the Lord of the Nazgul list. Uh, the Lord of the Nazgul I was super interested in, and honestly, uh, I think it was just a matter of the fact that Lord of the Rings had so many interesting commanders that it sort of just escaped my mind. But this commander is super sick. The idea is that, you know, it's kind of like a Talrand, except for you get access to blue and black, and it makes some 3-3s three that really start pumping themselves up, right? So this is just a bit of a classic like blue black control deck. A lot of the things you'd kind of see with like Talion, but with a few more spicy includes. And I genuinely think this deck's got some legs to it, right? This is very much that like classic blue black attrition style deck with, you know, some definitely spicy stuff in the 99. We have, you know, some Lazatep plating here, which is a card I've definitely never seen in this EDH game, but uh, I remember it very fondly from the War of the Spark days. I love having the free spells in a deck like this to trigger your commander more often every turn, right? Because we have Snuff Out, My Break Trap Force, Will Force Negation, Deadly Rollick, Fierce, like a bunch of free spells packed as well, Slaughter Packed. Just a lot of stuff to get your commander going onto the race is pretty early. It's definitely clearly a bit of a controlling style deck here, right? We have some crazy stuff in the top end too, the things like Bolus' Citadel, which I'm a little surprised to see a Graph Digger's Cage deck with the Bolus' Citadel. It seems that they're going for the full Bolus' top line, right? Because you have Citadel, Aether Flux Reservoir, and Setsay's Dividing Top. So once again, a little bit surprised that we're seeing a bit of this contradiction in this list where we have like this Bolus, Aether Flux, uh, Citadel line with Graph Digger's Cage stopping this combo and Damping Sphere also stopping the, this particular combo. There's not a lot of ways to sacrifice your own artifacts, but I'm assuming the main game plan is to sort of do the slower thing uh, to sort of attrition out the table. It's also worth noting that uh, you see Dramatic Scepter here, Dramatic Reversal and Isochron Scepter. Um, that does actually create infinite 3-3s three with your commander because it's whenever you cast an instant sorcery spell, Isochron Scepter will trigger that commander. So you'll definitely have a board of infinite 9-9 creatures, which is uh, definitely far from bad. So this deck is really, really cool. Definitely some spicy options you see in Italian decks sometimes like Adalith. Uh, Braids, you don't see a lot in Italian, but you do see it in some of the grindier decks of our format for sure. Apart from that, we have some more of the classic win cons. Definitely interested to see Whispering Madness here as the wheel of choice for this list, but it does sort of make sense when you give the context of, you know, this is a flying commander that makes three threes with, I'm pretty sure, Menace, right? Uh, wraith creature with Menace. Yeah, so Wraiths have Menace, your commander has flying. It kind of makes sense that you have this evasive attacker and, you know, if you really want those repeated wheel effects with your commander and with uh, things like Orcish Bowmasters and Shieldred, kind of makes sense that that would be happening with this list. Uh, anyways, this is sick. I'm like so happy that this is the first deck I covered and this is definitely one of the factors 
that convinced me to do this tournament, even though it was like two weeks ago at the time of this recording, I was like, there's no way I'm not covering this deck. It looks so awesome. And uh, <laughs> yeah, congrats to our pilot Caster Moon for, for top 16 ing with this very cool deck. We have Draco92 with the very original name of Blue Farm. <laughs> This is uh, seemingly a very classic blue farm list. Some of the spice here right away with the Shieldred and the 99. Apart from that, uh, I didn't really see too, too many things that stuck out to me as like crazy blue farm includes. You know, a lot of people had talked about Shieldred very early in blue farm's career when, when Shieldred had come out. I guess not in blue farm's career, but in Shieldred's career. Um, but it usually is not in most of these blue farm lists. The rest of the blue farm stuff is, is pretty standardized. You don't see like a Teferi in here or anything like that. Uh, but you do have your classic Intuition Breach lines, you have Mnemonic Betrayal, you have your Adnaz, you have your Dockside, all of that good stuff. There's a, This one is like, feels like it's going bigger than a lot of other blue farm lists, right? We have a Shieldred, we have a One Ring, we have a Smothering Tithe. You know, there's a lot of high-end threats. I'm actually curious to see what the Adnaz curve is here on this deck, which actually Moxfield does show you. Yeah, so it's a 1.32, which is honestly slimmer than I thought, given how many four drops are in this deck. So. That's a, it's a pretty interesting number here for this list, but you know, a very, uh, very large blue farm list able to make the top 16 in this cut. Edmus 2003 here with Yuriko Doomsday. We have pretty classic Yuriko stuff going on here. You know, I, I've definitely seen Yuriko lists swap around what's pretty standard from, from time to time, but this is very much striking me as a classic, classic Yuriko list here. I'm definitely seeing more of these Yuriko lists have one ring and still play that even through no rods and stuff like that. Yuriko can really break parity a lot on a lot of these like classic stacks effects, which is one of the biggest benefits of the deck is that if your opponent's decks sort of fall to one of these pieces, there's a solid chance you can really outgrind your opponents with by just doing your like pretty classic ninjutsu style stuff. The rest of the deck is big spells that you want to flip over with Yuriko. Insidious Streams, not always a Yuriko include, but was definitely one that was talked about a lot when Yuriko first came out. Reasonable Doubt's definitely a new one. That one feels uh, maybe like it's just a newer card. I, I would be very surprised. Uh, I guess it does give Yuriko evasion, which is kind of cute. Um, huh, that's kind of fascinating. I'm <laughs> very interested in that one. I assume that's just to give Yuriko menace, basically, because Suspect gives the thing menace and means it can't be blocked. Greatest Grasp, not one I often see in these Yuriko lists, but apart from that, pretty classic Yuriko. We got a decent amount of ninjas in here, some nice cool tempo pieces like Spell Stutters, right, which I actually really like. And uh, the rest of it is just trying to sort of curve into Yuriko and trying to get those early evasive attackers, make Yuriko come out sooner rather than later, and then start getting those triggers and eventually win with either Thoracle or just Ninja Burn. We have C. Chapman 26, and this was also one of the decks that I got really excited about seeing here. We have Mox Farm uh, with Jahira Gildard as in, which, I, and actually I saw Jahira and saw that it was red, and I thought this actually might've been Street Urchin, because I'm very used to seeing Street Urchin with Jahira, and by very used to it, I mean, I have seen that as the combination people have tried, but Jahira plus Guild Artisan was definitely not what I was expecting. Uh, basically, Jahira plus the ability to make two treasures pretty much right out of the command zone means that you're kind of getting your commander package all in one. What's really cool about background commanders, and I don't know if I've ever talked about it on the show, is that they actually count as a commander, right? Even though they're just enchantments. So for example, things like Deflecting Swat are actually turned online with your Guild Artisan. And I'm definitely curious to see if uh, they are playing Deflecting Swat in this list. Yeah, I assumed as much for, for a uh, Gruul list. Now, it seems like the list that this linked to, uh, unfortunately, does already have the updates from Outlaws of Thunder Junction, and it linked us to a live list as opposed to the list that was being played at the tournament. So. So about, the tournament was about 16 days ago. So this is about the stuff that changed. Um, seems to be like right after the tournament. So these, these were all adjustments made right before and then seeming like these are the ones that uh, happened right after the tournament happened. So there haven't been too many because this is a lot of this stuff is um, just in the considering board here, right? So like the only things that have been added to the main board have been new stuff from Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Um, but it seems to me that this list is very much like a tempo-y list, but there's a lot of stuff here and I would not be surprised if I am definitely missing synergies in this list. Now there's obviously lines here with like Dockside Extortionist, Combined with Team Sabertooth, able to make infinite mana, 
that way, but we don't really have an outlet in the command zone. And this is one of the reasons I was confused that people aren't playing Street Urchin in this deck, because Street Urchin is a background that allows you to pay one, sack another creature or artifact and deal one damage, right? So if you make infinite treasures with Street Urchin, uh, you're able to just ping your opponents down infinitely, right? So seeing that they have the Teamer Sabertooth combo in this deck, I was very surprised that this was not the Street Urchin background. Once again, I saw Jahiro plus red and assumed they had this very clean win condition uh, in the CZ, but it's uh, it's much more of the value engine in, in the command zone as well. So we definitely have some value things here, some value walkers in Karn and Minskin Boo. We definitely got some classic gruel items. Academy manufacturers here, uh, obviously, it makes the treasures that come from your command zone turn into foods and clues, which I'm uh, assuming is not just a, a low value thing, but also has some other synergy here. This is a tooth and nail deck. We have Kiki Jiki combos with Kiki and Hyrax Tower Scout. Oh, I guess roll tokens do tap for green because this is just tokens you control have add tap to add green. So I guess a roll token, that's actually kind of funny, uh, can be used to tap and generate mana. So this is something that gives your creatures hexproof and also allows turns into a mana rock afterwards, which is kind of fun. Um, yeah, this deck also has some combos with Dino DNA. Uh, clearly Magda is a big part of this deck because there's like a portal to Phyrexia here in the list. Uh, this stuff is sick. I mean, there's no, is there Cloudstone Curio? There is a Cloudstone Curio. Okay, so like Magda plus the treasures generated from your commander can pull you into a Cloudstone Curio line, which makes a lot of sense. That that seems like a very solid way to be able to win the game. Uh, Dino DNA plus Dockside is also an infinite combo because you can, uh, if there is a Dockside in the graveyard, it's a very expensive combo to be clear. You, you need to have Dockside generate more than seven treasures, or sorry, seven or more treasures. Uh, and then you can just make infinite dinosaurs that are a copy of Dockside. But this deck is kind of what was also a breach deck. What? <laughs> uh, a Trinisphere breach deck. OK. All right. Without any breach lines, it kind of seems. Hmm. OK. My intuition with this list is that it's mostly a Cloudstone Curio deck and like a lot of it is uh just that teamer value goodness this is a wild deck for sure is there a dual caster mage in here too okay yeah so there are also dual caster twin flame lines for for the clean wins um a lot of sort of compounding layered gruel win cons in what is definitely a spicy deck for sure so congrats to our pilot for bringing this absolutely buck wild list and and doing really well with it uh making the top 16 of this tournament this this deck is a roller coaster and i'm glad to have uh, taken a ride on it <laughs> and we'd like to thank one of our sponsors for today tales of adventure magic they are an awesome store and vendor you'll see them at a ton of different events throughout the year and they always have a crazy inventory and especially for those who really like bling they have uh, an awesome online store as well. And all the information for that will be in the description down below. You can check that out and get 5% off if you use code comedian at checkout, which is pretty cool. <laughs> we have Pyro James here with Godo the Chosen One. We gotta love a Godo in top 16. Um, you know, one of the tournaments I was at recently, I guess at the start of this year was uh, one of an SCG where uh, Ryan from Playing With Power was able to top 16 and Godo. Wasn't able to cover that part of that event. So I'm glad that we at least get to have Goto featured on the channel this year. Goto's a soft spot for me always, just because, you know, I love that mono red goodness. I love, 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 love seeing a wandering archaic in Goto. I think that is such a good call. Um, I think it's like a kind of a perfect Goto card. It is one of those cards that just fits in decks where you just have a stupid amount of mana and you don't always have card draw and you just need something to be able to just pull your advantage ahead. Yeah, that's that's hot tech and I absolutely love it. I'm also sorry if the Goto pilots are all on that now. The last I heard of Goto, it was not. Dualcaster and Twin Flame Heat Shiver. I love having the backup win con in this version of Goto. This is this is the kind of Goto that I can get behind playing for sure. I am all about this Goto. Yeah, I, maybe I'm uh, you know outdated on some of the Goto tech here, but this version is is really speaking to me. And uh, you know maybe maybe some Goto plays in my future. It's it's always a deck that I, you know I'm I'm a giant mono red fan as as longtime followers of the channel will know. So. Uh, you know, maybe this is maybe this is Goto's time to to finally make me sleeve it up for uh, for a big tournament. I love Goto. I think it's super fun, super explosive, and I love the choices for this specific variant of Goto. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff here. We got our blast to protect our Goto. We got ricochet trap, which I haven't seen in a hot minute. Love seeing a power kinesis here. I think it's super awesome for low color red decks. Uh, we got bolt. We got our accelerants with theft. This is. 
This is some sick Goto stuff. I'm all about it. Sting is also kind of cool. Um, beginning of each combat, untapped, equip creature. I don't really know what it's doing with Goto particularly, but you find it fascinating. I feel like I usually see it in decks that are much more interested in their commander having like a really powerful tap ability. You know, I love a Blood Moon. I love, love, love a Blood Moon. This deck is actually really cool. I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm like kind of jazzed at the idea of playing Goto right now because I really like the way this this specific variant is built. So congrats, Pyro James. You are really selling me on Goto with this build. Uh, and once again, I do apologize to the Goto community if a lot of these are standard nowadays. I've, I've not been following Goto with the most astute eye. <laughs> we have Mad King with Corvold the Mad King. This is pretty classic Corvold list. Got some interesting stuff here. We definitely don't have super crazy stuff with this Goto. I know there can be certain variants of Goto that are like super out there playing really wacky sacrifice combos. This one looks a little bit more like that traditional Corvold in the sense that it's definitely that more aggressively slanted, more focused on the Adnaz style. Um, yeah, Adnaz style, okay. Whew. This is not sorted by uh, Amanda Value, so it threw me off there. But yeah, definitely Adnaz style Corvold. We got our grinding stations. We got, you know, our breach line, stuff like that. Got a little bit of that reanimate for sacking your dock side and recasting your dock side and sacking your dock side again. Classic, classic Corvold stuff here. Uh, we've got a lot of really cool grindy value. We got Saw in Half, which I think is such a funny thing that that is just like uh, a Corvold card nowadays. We got the Ruthless Technomancer, which I feel like Corvold pilots are like all on now. But it, I feel like there was a period of time where that was not like universally accepted as a Corvold card. But nowadays it's just like, boom, auto snap. We got a Corvold card here. Uh, this is pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty classic grindy Corvold, proving people wrong when there are haters on the deck. Uh, Corvold still able to show up, do its thing, you know, maybe not taking down the whole tournament, but still showing up and putting in work. We have Cowboy Bob here with a flying Zombo and <laughs> that chick Redux Noxity. This is Timnacrom. Yeah, oh, this is just Timnacrom. Okay, that name convinced me for a second that it was Francisco. This is Blue Farm. <laughs> Another Shildra Blue Farm. Okay, maybe this is a Tennessee thing that I'm unaware of, but We've got another Shouldered Blue Farm here. This is a one ring list too. I'm gonna, I am currently pulling up the other Blue Farm list from this tournament and comparing the two of them because this is very interesting to me because a lot of these very particular and specific choices seem to be reflected. Okay, so they've got six cards different. The Blue Farm we saw earlier has a Talisman switch. So Blue Black instead of Red Black. A Windfall, Angel's Grace, Smothering Tithe, Snapback, and Minamo versus a Forbidden Orchard, Dauntless, Smantler, Red Blast, Born Upon a Wind, and Snap. Interesting. I feel like I kind of like a couple cards out of each of these piles, which is very funny. Um, but yeah, we have uh, another Blue Farm list here, a couple cards apart for sure. Um, we have Cowboy Bob with this this version of the deck, and uh, yeah, it's, that's really as much as there is to say when you have six cards different from the card the deck we already covered. But uh, yeah, congrats on Top 16. We've got... Browdy? Uh, with Omnath, Locus of Creation, Jelly Bean. We haven't seen Omnath in a hot minute on this channel and I'm all about it. This is really cool. Definitely what seems to be a more low to the ground, breachy type of Jelly Bean style list. Definitely interested in the fact that like this seems a little bit more explosive. You know, we got like Darcy and stuff like that, but very low on the artifact count, which is kind of cool. Definitely not like going fully into like a whole Mox Opal plan here, but we definitely have our Chrome Mox uh, and like all of the, the normal stuff, right? But I feel like we're like missing some fast man. I guess obviously we don't get Jeweled Lotus because that's uh, not fantastic here, but I guess we aren't really. A lot of talismans, which makes sense when your commander is uh, white, blue, red, green, right? So that's definitely something very interesting with this commander. Um, we have what seems to be the Ephemerate Spellseeker lines here. For those who don't know, you get Spellseeker, you blink it on your turn, you go get a Final Fortune, you Final Fortune on upkeep, the Ephemerate comes back, you go get your Enlightened Tutor, gets your uh, Underworld Breach on top of your library, and then you're able to get the Spellseeker flickered once again out of your graveyard, go grab Brain Freeze, ta -da, you got a whole pile there, and, and you can Enlighten Tutor to put it on top as well, uh, the LED specifically. So that's a whole one card combo in a can that, that any red, white, blue deck can have with Spellseeker, which is pretty cool, right? Breach is obviously very important to those colors, so it's nice to just be like, okay, cool, here's my one card Breach combo, right? Um, on top of that, we have Displacer Kitten lines here, we have Teferi, in the deck, so Deferi plus Displacer Kitten, as we all know, uh, creates an infinite draw combo uh, with any sort of rock that is either neutral 
or uh, generating you mana, right? So any of our things like Chrome Mox, Mox Amber, Lotus Petal, all that stuff, not Mox Diamond, because it obviously sacrifices itself. Then we have Emil here, Emil Pestoxide, um, and any of these sort of infinite mana combos uh, generate infinite, uh, oh, well, you can't actually see the text here on Omnath, but uh, if we were to, I don't know, hypothetically look at a different printing <laughs> or look at the details here, when it ETBs, you draw, right? So anytime you get the Emil Dockside thing, you can just switch over to flickering your commander and be able to take your opponents out. Um, I've noticed there's no food chain, which is traditionally associated with this version of um, Omnath, right? Omnath is a food chain outlet in these colors, but I think it's a very prudent decision to not play that combo in this deck because clearly, you know, you've got a lot of things that work really well with the breach plan. You've got a pretty decent amount of creatures that work with your creature infinite uh, mana plan that way. And food chain's a really hard card to tutor in these colors, right? Unlike breach, which a lot of your tutors that could get food chain or like the setup you could do just tutor breach better in these colors. So it does make sense to not really rely on food chain because food chain's much better in decks that have black. So you can taint it packed amount of consultation for them. You know, all of that great exile stuff, right? So I'm actually really, uh, you know, intrigued and, and sort of like proud of this deck builder for, for making that decision because Omnath has been one that a lot of people have tried for a really long time. And it just feels like the deck always sort of folds in upon itself, right? Because it's very similar to the Thrasios Bruce archetypes, right? Obviously, Emil Doxide being like one of your main win cons, you have access to basically all the same combos and stuff like that. Um, but sometimes Jelly Bean doesn't really quite do the same stuff, right? Um, it, it definitely helps a little bit more with the Breach Plan, especially if you get your commander out and then play a fetch land. You also see Dryad Arbor here too, which is um, important to know because that is a way to actually be able to kill your opponents with a land drop, right? Because when you have Dryad Arbor, um, you can flicker it with a meal and then reset your commander so that you're getting all of Omnath's uh, land abilities, right? For, for its basically uh, landfall mode. And the last one being Omnath deals four damage to each opponent in each player if it's the third time this ability activates, right? So what you can do is flicker the land, get the first one, flicker the land, get the second one, flicker the land, get the third one, then you flicker Omnath to reset it so it doesn't recognize it as the first, second, or third time the ability is triggered. Because it's not land drops per turn, it's specifically how many times Omnath's ability has triggered that turn. And when it gets flickered, it's a new game object. So you can kill people with a Dryad Arbor, which is kind of hot. <laughs> Congrats for a pilot for making a very interesting Omnath build. Do you see what I'm talking about this tournament? It, it is pretty sweet. We got Soul Rack here with King Kenny needs a win. -y. Uh, <laughs> this is a Kenrith build here in this top 16. Got some interesting stuff in it already from what I'm seeing. We've got uh, the Vigian Graft Mage combo, which Vigian Graft Mage and I believe Incubation Druid is the thing that makes it go infinite, uh, which is already pretty cool. Yeah, because if you have Incubation Druid with a counter on it, um, yeah, in Vision Graf Mage, you untap a creature with a counter on it, but uh, the Incubation Druid makes three mana, right? So you're able to then generate infinite mana of any color with that combo. You can also do that, I'm pretty sure, with the Kami of the Whispered Hopes, because if you get two counters on it, uh, it then, you know, uh, makes three mana cost two to untap with the Graf Mage's ability. We also have the classic Emil plus Dockside stuff in here. Woo, -hoo, new stuff. Uh, we have Displacer Kitten plus the Fairy. So this is a very combo heavy deck. We've got Agatha's Vile, Agatha of the Vile Cauldron, pardon me. And we have uh, Deserta here to clearly reduce the activated abilities of not only our commander, but our combos that we mentioned. This is also a Breach deck, a Survival of the Fittest deck, which is kind of cool with Kenrith. Kenrith is really, really, really good with the graveyard, right? You can throw things in the graveyard with Kenrith's ability. You can pull them back out. Um, you know, sometimes you just need an uncounterable way to try and win the game. Uh, this is a Thoracle Consult deck as well. So this deck's kind of wild in the sense it's like, there's a lot of creature combos. There's a lot of counter combos. There's a lot of breach stuff. There's Thoracle Consult. It's not a Nas thing for sure, but there's intuition lines. Um, yeah, I mean, a little light on interaction actually, which is kind of crazy uh, for this being a five color deck here. But this deck seems like it's really just like, Big, big combo soup, uh, which is definitely not a bad thing, right? Big combo soup wins games. And uh, clearly this uh, pilot was able to win enough to make the top 16 here with this this Kenny Needs a Winnie deck. Pretty cool. I always like seeing a Kenrith build. I think Kenrith is just one of those commanders that can be built in so many unique and interesting ways. It does definitely seem like this mid-range soup style is, is the most helpful for Kenrith for a lot of these pilots. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's the only way to build the deck. I've seen some very successful like mid-range Nas versions of Kenrith. I've seen much more like Displacer Kitten heavy versions of the deck. I think there's a lot of really cool space with Kenrith. And uh, yeah, I really like to see the deck. It's evolved so much over the years. I mean, Stacks Kenrith used to be the most popular Kenrith build for a period of time. 
Gundam is wild, and uh, I'm glad more people are playing around with the commander because it definitely is a powerful option. It's always been in like the top 10 of the, the format. It's just not a deck people talk about a lot. So I love seeing the innovation here with this version of the list for sure. Yeah, rich homie John with Rock Silas till I die list. Uh, let's see here. We got, always got to check the land count. How many we got? How many we got? 24 lands. All right. It's looking like a pretty normal rock side. We got our Necropotence Born Upon the Wind lines. We've got a lot of artifacts here. To be honest, it's the first rock side I've seen in Top Cut in a hot minute uh, that I've done coverage on. But uh, on the other hand, I have seen rock side do very well. Uh, many pilots are very confident, confident and competent with the deck. Uh, the idea for those who have not seen Rogsai, and uh, for this is the first time, I would be very surprised by that, but Rogsai is the Turbo Nas deck of the format, right? If you are trying to go fast, it is the fastest gun in the West, right? You are trying to get your Rogrek out, which basically turns into a Mox Amber. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the time you can use it to sacrifice to a number of effects. You can use it to tap Springleaf, tap for Paradise Mantle, uh, or, you know, just be a free Mox Amber. Once again, uh, Mox Amber turning on in turn one, right? So Rog gets your game plan going faster. That's really all it does in the command zone. It's a nice free thing to sacrifice. It's a nice thing to tap early mana sources, but it's the fastest deck we got. And it is good at doing that thing for sure. It does have some okay grind plans here. I did notice that this version is on the one ring. This version's also on some Notion Thief plans, which I do think as the format gets more mid rangey you do sort of need these alternate pivot plans. And I definitely don't hate Notion Wheel and uh, one ring kind of being like the backup stuff for this deck. So congrats to our pilot. I'm making top 16 on the, the Rogzai goodness. We have Stouts here with another very A tier name, Kinnon. <laughs> Uh, we have a cannon deck. Let's check the land count. Check the land count. We got 26 in this version of the deck. Um, definitely a lot of the stuff we see in pretty standard cannon lists here. Um, this version does seem quite similar to Wounded Satellites list. Uh, his, his primer list, um, grind them into dust. And uh, not, not too many crazy changes here. But it's a it's a pretty good Kinnon list. Kinnon is still one of the top decks in the format. I would not be surprised to see a pilot show up and win the next tournament with it. Kinnon is still very strong, very powerful. I know a lot of people have been kind of talking to me lately that uh, Kinnon is definitely receiving a little bit more hate than it has in the past, uh, just because, you know, its reputation finally started to catch up to it. But here we still have it, making top 16 and uh, continuing to put up good results. So congrats to Stouts on bringing it to the tournament. We have Magda with what I'm assuming is supposed to say style with <laughs> by Darius. We got a Magda list here. Oh, we got Invasion of Tarkir. That's pretty cool as a removal spell that's also a battle. Um, yeah, we got our dwarf goodness here. Magda is a pretty classic mono red option at this point. Definitely a staple of the format. You know, it has its peaks and valleys where some tournaments it will do really well and make top 16 and other tournaments it will fall on its face. But here we have a Magda list doing pretty well. I'm always so fascinated to see what each individual Magda pilot decides is worth the inclusion in the deck, right? We have some cool stuff here in this list, like Knight Paladin, one of the Warhammer 40K options, just because it's a pretty cheap crew one. And when it ETBs, it deals four to each opponent, which uh, I think does combo when you have Magda out with Tel Jalad Stylus, which is kind of fun. You like tuck it back into your deck and then uh, pull it back out to deal infinite damage to your opponent. So you have Terror of the Peaks to do that too. This version seems like it's got a lot, a lot, a lot of layering for that in instant speed win with Magda, which maybe is not the most necessary to have so much, ma um, you know, there. But oh, we'd love to see Bottle Cap last. I was definitely, as soon as I saw this card printed, I was like, oh, this is going to see Magda play. And I'm, I'm very glad to have been proven correct on that. This card is very, very cool. Um, makes a bunch of tap treasures, which you definitely need to make a commander work, which is kind of cool because you can also tap treasures to cast it, get a bunch of tap treasures, and then sacrifice them to Magda because Magda does not get on tap treasures to activate its ability. So very cool to see that card actually seeing play here. This is definitely a more heavy on the dragon version of Magda, but it's very cool to see. I've seen a bunch of different stuff in Magda lately. Like I saw Chizgoria the other day. I've saw like a no dragon version of, of Magda. There's a lot of really cool stuff with this commander. And I'm always so fascinated to see what each individual pilot prioritizes as far as what the tutor targets are for Magda. And uh, really cool to see also like a Graph Digger's Cage on Magda, right? Like this deck definitely having games where it's like, nah, I don't even need to search my library for dudes. Like we're just gonna keep it strictly permanence, which is kind of fun, or strictly non-creature 
permanence, right? <laughs> But yeah, cool stuff out of this Magda list. It's very, very cool. Before we get into this top four, I want to remind you that we do coaching here at Comedian MTG. If you're interested in taking that next step in your CEDH career, if you want to prep for the tournaments, or if you're just getting into the format and you really want some of the best advice to helping get into this format, uh, I do that as basically my full-time career. Um, so find me at comedianmtg at gmail.com. You can find me, and once again, all these places are going to be in the description down below, but you can find me over at Twitter at comedianmtg or find me on Discord at comedian underscore mtg. Once again, all those places down in the description where you can find me and inquire about CEDH coaching. It's been an awesome process. I'm starting to gather a bunch of reviews from happy clients who I've worked with in the past and some of them have gone on to top four tournaments, top 16 tournaments, win tournaments. Um, you know, I've had a client who just said they've top 16 every event since they got coaching for me. So there's a lot of success out there with my clients and I love this process. I'm so excited to get to work with hopefully you in the future. So if you're curious about that stuff, contact me in any of those places and uh, I'm excited to see what happens next. We have The Better Joyra by Match MTG here in the top four. Uh, spoiler, this was also one of the cool lists that made me want to cover this tournament. This is Two Mana Joyra, the very cool Joyra, the Joyra that I keep saying is super underexplored and that I keep not spending time on working on. Uh, so cool here in this top four of this 81 person event, clearly a Joyra list that's doing very well. Very cool stuff here uh, out of this deck, it does a lot. The basic point of the deck from my understanding is that you get to a point where you are just trying to get a bunch of taps with this Joyra ability, right? And you're just dumping the artifacts from your hand onto the battlefield. And I know there's definitely combo lines in the deck. Oh, I love to see a twiddle. <laughs> there's a twiddle in this deck, that's sick. We got a dramatic reversal, which makes a lot of sense. You're trying to untap your commander. There's also clearly a dramatic reversal on Ice Crown Scepter lines in this list. And then you look at the artifacts and it's like, my goodness, there's a lot of spicy stuff in here for sure. We got a Patriarch Seal, which is a mana rock that untaps your commander. You got a Mage Rite Stone, which just untaps your commander, which is still pretty cool. Uh, we got some acceleration here. We got Imposter Mech to clone your opponent's stuff. We got Torpor Orb to disrupt your opponents. You know, imagine your opponent's dock side is on the stack and you're like, yeah, my commander, you don't have an ETB. Nice try, dude. We got um, Lithoform Engine, which also technically goes infinite with Dramatic Reversal and probably does some other stuff with some combos that I don't understand here, but that's okay. We've got uh, <laughs> a Ring of Three Wishes, which is basically a 10 mana Demonic Tutor a couple times because uh, you remove a, a counter from it and you just search your library for any card. But you know, when you look at the deck like this, it's like, yeah, kind of makes sense that they can afford that stuff. Um, Got a Mind Over Matter here, which we know goes infinite with the One Ring, because uh, you can then tap to draw a card, you activate Mind Over Matter's ability, discarding and untapping the ring, then you tap draw two, and you're like, oh, hey, now I'm netting cards. You tap, you know, do, do that whole thing. You draw a significant majority of your deck. You have to be careful because you start only being able to draw in like very finite amounts because you're eventually going to get to the point where you cannot, uh, you know, it'll be like, your, your one ring will be on like 12 or something like that, right? And you only have like 10 cards left in your library and then you can't like, you don't, you don't want to die. <laughs> um, but this deck's also kind of doing the Magda uh, Arkham Dagson thing where you got these big disruptive artifacts. You got Chamil the Inner Sun, which I'm so happy to see because this card is sick. And also that art, I haven't actually seen the full art one. That's metal as hell. Uh, you got cards like Coveted Jewel, which is my favorite like low color artifact creature staple, which I know doesn't mean anything with the way I've just said that, but it's like, I, it happens enough that I think this card is so funny to keep seeing. We see it in like Sakodama and like a bunch of other weird decks like that. I've got a refocus in here, then tap your creatures, draw some cards, then tap your commander. Uh, you got a Cerulean Wisps. Oh my goodness, this is a, this is a wild deck for sure. Like the idea that you can at instant speed be like, oh, okay, well, commander's only on two and it's tapped. I can't really do anything. You're like, sure, Cerulean wisps it and then drop in a torpor orb or a thousand year elixir and then untap and then do it again. It's like, what? <laughs> this is so cool. Uh, yeah, this list is wild and it's a trip. And I'd like not even to mention the fact there's a freaking Memnarch in here, right? Like, <laughs> there's a whole lot of clones, I noticed. Quarter Munder probably just to untap your commander but it's kind of cool that Quarter Monitor specifically works with your commander because you can tap Joyra, put in the Quarter Monitor for free, then untap and immediately get a four drop at instant speed, which is pretty cool because I don't think Joyra has any. Yeah, Joyra is 100% able to be tapped at instant speed. So you can just kind of like play Joyra, just be like, 
who's going to go first. You know what I mean? Who's going to walk right into this stuff first? I'm actually surprised to not see like a lightning greaves in the deck, but given how many untappers I just talked about for the past couple minutes, it does make sense. Um, interesting to also see like this rings of bright hearth combos with basalt monolith and, and chromatic ori. So like obviously infinite colorless is definitely something you can do in the deck and filter it to a few uh, interesting cards. Yeah, this is a this is a sick deck. I I really think this is pretty fascinating, and um, I I love a brew. This is so cool. I know uh, Sam Black was working on a version of this deck for a long time, and a spleen face from into the north is working on this deck for a while. But uh, love seeing it make a top four of a pretty large sized tournament. This is really really cool and a very spicy list. Uh, hope to see more of this drawer because yeah, this is. Um, yeah, this is just rad. I don't know. <laughs> this is super cool. We've got Outlaw 9401 with Blue Farm 2.0. So we had Blue Farm earlier in this breakdown, and now this is the second one. <laughs> uh, okay, so we got a little bit of different stuff here. We got Italian in this version. There's no more Shieldreds in this one. We also got Ledger Shredder, which has been sort of the decline as far as Blue Farm inclusion, and kind of one that I've always really liked. Loved seeing a Teferi in a blue farm deck. No kitten to combo with, but that's pretty standard with Teferi inclusions. Very few folks are doing that. Um, but Teferi, love to see it in here. Love me an extra Grand Abolisher in my deck. That's all folks run that. Two wheels, kind of fascinating. Angel's Grace, I know it was in a couple of the other ones from earlier. Um, but apart from that, not too many crazy things. We got Smothering Tide, they got a one ring. So these definitely more grindy blue farm lists are definitely showing up. 1.3 curve, so a little bit lower than our, our ones from earlier. But uh, yeah, all right, we got a got an interesting blue farm deck here with uh, some some differences from our other two, but not too too many. Uh, congrats to our pilot for making the top four. Oh, we got a Darcy here. I didn't even mention that Dragon Rage Chandler, which is definitely once again like Ledger Shredder and Darcy, are definitely like considered older blue farm tech, which is uh, kind of cool because this was a blue farm version that I've I've always enjoyed, which is. You know, a few more of these like surveil, pump stuff in the graveyard, curve out kind of nice version. Euphoric End, which sounds like a euphemism. Uh, Kess dissing the mages. <laughs> it's a Kess dissident mage deck. You know, apart from my top four and this one uh, from my uh, the the recent Cash for Clash crap Clash for Cash. I said it right the first time. <laughs> uh, event that I did, um, and this one here, it's it's not a deck that's been played a whole lot, but. Here we have uh, Kess doing the Kess stuff. This one's wildly different than the one I played against, though. Holy moly. Uh, yeah, can you tell that sometimes I react to these decks live? <laughs> what? This is crazy. OK, so there's obviously the Underworld Breach uh, stuff that we can normally find in Kess. There's uh, Demonic Consultation, that's historical stuff. But clearly the stuff that I'm bugging out about is the fact that this is a necrotic ooze cast list. <laughs> what? That's so freaking cool. It's like Ch Chainer Dementia Master in here too. Yeah, Endling, which I can only assume is also part of some weird necrotic ooze combos. Yo, this is crazy. We got Buried Alive, Dark Petition. A bunch of these reanimation effects too, like got sacrum. Is there like a hoarding brood? There's a hoarding broodlord in line in here too with peer into the abyss. This is sick. I have gotten on record talking about how I don't think reanimator has a consistent enough shell. And here we have this 81 person tournament with a top four Kess reanimator necrotic ooze deck. Oh, I'm geeking out. <laughs> I wonder if there's an Agathas. There's no Agathas here, which I think is kind of interesting because you like kind of want that for Necrotic Goose stuff, but also kind of don't want that because you don't want to exile the stuff you're interested in. So for those who heard me mention, uh, we have the Saw in Half Broodlord lines earlier in this. Don't know about that. You get Broodlord out, you Saw in Half it, it makes two Broodlords, then you get Sacrifice, Appear in the Abyss, and you basically have a one card way to uh, assemble Appear in the Abyss line, which is pretty hot. Um, obviously, I don't think this is an ad on this list. Yeah, yeah. But wow, Reanimator Kess was not expecting to be seen today. I was already looking at these spicy decks from this tournament. And here we have, I was like, Kess, Kess is pretty cool. We don't see Kess a lot. Kess is always built the same way. And man, am I fully consuming my words. This is so freaking wild. Wow. 
Yeah, like, okay, so uh, the Necrotic Goose Pile, for anyone who uh, is not familiar with this version, as long as you have uh, some combination of the ability to make three black or three cards to discard, right? So if you have one black and two cards to discard, it, it works like this, right? But if you have Necrotic Goose, Scourge Familiar, and Asmodeus the Archfiend, you're able to discard three cards, right? Hence adding that three black, right? And then use Asmodeus' abilities to draw seven cards. So basically for every seven cards in your deck, you pitch uh, three of them, draw seven, pitch three, draw seven, netting four every single time. You're filling up your graveyard for Breach, and you can either Breach win people or you can Thoracle people and do all that stuff. And I'm assuming the Ballista and the Endling and the Chainer are here for some different sort of line that clearly I'm not uh, picking up on, but yeah. Wow, this is so cool. Congrats to our pilot for, for fully boggling my mind here with this deck. This is really, really cool to see. And yeah, I am truly all about it. This is so freaking sick. I, I love reanimator stuff. I'm always so sad that I don't feel like I can play it in CDH. And here we have this super cool cast reanimator. Uh, wow, I'm actually geeked. <laughs> we have Freddy here with Sisse Revisited. Uh, this is a really cool Sisse list too, right? So you're gonna see some stuff in here that's pretty classic Sisse. And then there's some, there's some spice. There's some, there's a couple little, uh, little jalapenos in this piece, right? So for those who don't know classic Sisse list, you wanna end up in a situation where you have Aminatu, Nicol Bolas, and Oath of Teferi. Um, you're basically at that point able to flicker infinite amount of permanence, and at that point you should hopefully be able to generate infinite color, uh, infinite amount of any color, and then pull uh, your legends out of your deck, winning with a number of different ways. This is one of those Sisei lists that uses the Cultist of the Absolute line, right? So you have Cultist of the Absolute, uh, then you activate again, you go get Ihada up here in the Planeswalkers, which gives you an extra color which then gives you exactly enough of Sisse, or actually a little more than enough of Sisse to be able to pull the Chromatic Orrery out of your deck. And this is definitely the like fastest Sisse line that exists, right? Um, it just comes with a lot of like card quality issues and uh, also, you know, Cultists can sometimes cause you to get absolutely blown out by your own card because it does require you to sacrifice creatures. But I did mention some spice in this version, right? So first of all, very clearly know what their targets for removal are, right? We have a braid of Reptica and Resculpt. You know, the biggest problems that Sisei almost always faces are, you know, Curse Totem, Graf Digger's Cage, and Opposition Agent, which a braid of Reptica and Resculpt all hit, right? So I, I did really like seeing that in the removal suite. Very clearly an intentional decision by the pilot to be able to isolate those. Definitely uh, a fewer four drops than I think we're used to in Sisei, which is really saying something because there's a decent amount of four drops here. Uh, another one of those Phyrexian Metamorphs to say list, just like more clones, I guess, the better. Dockside is obviously so broken with say that it makes sense to include it here. We definitely see like a lot of the, I don't know, I feel like some of the heavy hitters that are traditionally associated with Sisei are not in here, but like not all of them are missing. Um, this list is not on Mox Diamond. Huh, that's kind of interesting. How many, it's a 29 land Sisei list, just not running a Mox Diamond? Well, that leaves me curious as to why that's the case. <laughs> I, I'm like wondering if it was, I think this was a proxy friendly tournament, so I'm wondering if it was just like a budget thing, but I, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, pricey cards in here, like a guy's cradle, but there's no Mox Diamond. Oh, huh. okay, cool. Back to the spice I was referring to though, uh, one of them being Displacer Kitten, right? So uh, this deck can already basically pull Teferi out at uh, any time you get Sisse at four power, right? So the idea that Teferi then just immediately becomes a win con with one creature in your deck is pretty interesting. We also have the alternate uh, win con here of Felidar Guardian. For this don't know, Felidar Guardian specifically combines with Sahili, uh, which was the standard combo back in the day, but basically you're able to use Sahili's minus two to make copy Felidar, which then Felidar comes in, flicker Sahili, resets the Planeswalker, and you're able to make infinite Felidar Guardians, which is not uh, traditionally associated with Sisei, so it's kind of cool to uh, see that combo in here as well. I think you can like sort of pull your legends out and like pull Felidar onto the field with Kinnon, right? If you have a mana, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if that's exactly the way the our, our, our pilot is like doing it here. I don't see any legends that like tutor creatures, so I feel like the Felidar thing is not as common, but Felidar also, fun fact, uh, combos with the meal and Gaia's Cradle, right? So if you have four uh, creatures, you're able to 
use Emil's ability to flicker Felidar, which would then flicker the guy's cradle, right? So then taps for if you tap for four, you can do infinite green mana and then hopefully filter that into the rest of your colors. But this is a, a pretty cool Sisei list, you know, just they not exactly breaking the fundamental concept of Sisei, but definitely playing some uh, some spicier inclusions, maybe the, at the cost of a few interaction pieces and also no Mox Diamond, <laughs> which is still fascinating to me. Um, definitely curious to, to hear if anyone has any insight as to why uh, that particular omission happened. But uh, yeah, we have a, a pretty cool Sisei list here with some interesting tech with the cats, right? We got a, a cat friendly Sisei list. And uh, yeah, very cool. Oh yeah, very cat friendly Sisse list actually, it's pretty fun. Oh, I should also mention Luris plus Displacer Kitten plus uh, Lotus Petal is uh, is a combo because you can play Lotus Petal, crack Lotus Petal. Um, when you play Lotus Petal again out of the graveyard with Luris' ability, Displacer Kitten triggers, you flicker Luris, so it's a new Luris and therefore you haven't played your one thing from the graveyard uh, per turn, kind of fun. Uh, another little secret combo in here. So this is uh, when, what I'm going to affectionately refer to as Cat Heavy Sisei. Uh, <laughs> is pretty cool. We have Cutsel in here too. So, so many cats. So many cats. <laughs> but sick. This was such a cool top 16. And I hope y'all can see why uh, maybe I didn't cover some more recent tournaments in favor of covering this tournament. Because the lists in here were so cool. I, I really love this tournament. I, I got to hear from y'all in the comments down below. Which do you think was the most spicy deck? Because there's a lot of choices for that category in this tournament. It's so cool. I'm actually super geeking about getting to cover this tournament. I love talking about spicy decks. I love seeing innovation in CEDH. Uh, you know, I had the option to cover like this or another big tournament and that one was playing like all meta decks with almost no spicy tech. And I was like, I have to do this. It's so cool. So super glad to have covered this tournament. Once again, 81 players. So this was not just some like local game store tournament where people were not bringing good stuff, right? This was a real large event where people were bringing the absolute gas and I am so excited to have covered it. Congrats to our players for making the top cut at this big tournament. Congrats to our players for making some spicy, spicy choices in this tournament and making for an, uh, a really cool time being able to cover it. You know, CEDH is a place where you can keep trying, you can keep pushing, you can keep doing new things and brewing. It's a self-correcting format. So while there are still some really good top decks out there, there's also people willing to push the boundaries and try new stuff. And that gives me so much hope and love for this format. So thank you all for watching. I hope I'll catch you next time. Catch you later. Peace.